So, uh, welcome to all of you. Um, we have this session three on pediatric ophthalmology on pediatric cataract. Uh, I am Ashish Doshi, and I will be moderating this uh, session. We have uh, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi as the chairman, Dr. Lahane sir as the co-chairman, and Dr. Nikhil Gokhale as the co-convener. And uh, co-moderating with me will be Dr. Pankaj Shah. So, we will be introducing the speakers as we uh, as we come to them. So first, we will have Dr. P. Vijay Lakshmi. She is from Arvind. As we all know, she is the chief medical consultant in pediatric ophthalmology and also the chief of Vision Rehabilitation Center at Madurai. So we'll invite Dr. P. Vijay Lakshmi to give us a talk on. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. We'll start. So please go ahead, madam. Your topic is assessment and intervention for cortical visual rehab uh, impairment. Yes, yes, yes. Right. Full screen for them. Yeah. Please share your screen, ma'am. Yes, yes, we are doing. I don't hear you, ma'am. Is it okay? Is the slide so uh, seen? Not yet, ma'am. Not yet? What do I do now? So it's a scene here. I focused it. You need to share the screen, ma'am. The, the green button down. Where is the, uh, which one to click on? The green one, ma'am. No. Green one, the share screen, ma'am. Make it full screen first, ma'am. Then yeah. the button yes. will be visible. Button was not visible with the full screen. I don't know why. You can ask a, I think you ask a young kid next to you. He'll be much smarter at the <laughs> gizmo. Gizmo's only, he was only helping me, my grandson. I know. So true, true. the green light, where is it? Mm. Like 4.24, there was a woman, which was, wait, wait, wait. Adam, you need to open your presentation first and then share the screen. Yeah, I have opened it. It is there. Uh, open full screen. I'm on the Zoom platform, no? the Zoom screen. If you can see all of our uh, names there, then yes. on that screen below, there is in a green thing written share screen with a small arrow. So if you just click on that button, uh, you will get the windows on the computer and you click on the presentation. Yeah, yeah I, would say, I see the green one. I see the, uh, yes, share screen. Yeah, and then my PowerPoint. You have to click the power. Now, yeah. uh, when you see the PowerPoint now, slide of your, you can minima minimize this now, and the PowerPoint must be in the background. And you click okay. the PowerPoint. Minimize point. it now. And, now. and, and PowerPoint. Then the PowerPoint. Yeah, just click it. Yes. Yeah, that's the way we used to do it. Yeah, yeah, just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah, sure. Please, please make it up. No, no hurry, ma'am. Good afternoon, Dr. Kokar, sir. Good afternoon, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi, madam. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Dr. Nikhil. Bye. Namaskar, how are you? Okay. You're safe as well. Sir, bus, everybody, please be safe and please take care. Yes, that's the motto. Morning, few seconds. Uh, Dr. Lani, sir, is in a meeting with the CM. I think he should be here. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Guha, madam. Good afternoon, Dr. Ashish. Good afternoon, ma'am. Dr. Jagatram, sir, I think he also is busy, but Dr. Simmer is here. That's why Jagatram, sir, will be here. Dr. Kavita, madam. Dr. Zai, Dr. Pankaj Shah. Everybody, good afternoon. Hi, Dr. Prachi. No, ma'am. Good afternoon, madam. Uh, since, uh, Should we start so with the next talk? Okay, if you want to. So, uh, as we wait for ma'am to log in uh, with her presentation, we will have Dr. Association Koka. She is from the RP Center. He's the professor and head of the unit, cataract and refractive surgery, and he will be speaking on cataracts, 
pre operative evaluation am i there okay. my screen is there see ma'am ma'am we are starting with the next one first you okay. are still not on okay, okay we'll just okay. wait for you to sort okay. out Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, ma'am. I am butting in, but I think because of the lack of time, I think we should start. In. No, no problem. No problem. Welcome, ma'am. Okay. So, are my slides visible? First thing. Yes. Yes. And yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So, I would like to thank Doctor Lahane uh, to give me the who has given me the opportunity to speak on this topic, and this topic is very close to my heart. Anything to do with the pediatric cataract, I am the first one to jump in, and. Uh, well we've been doing it for last 25 to 30 years and we realized there's certain things which uh, everybody does the things a little different so there are few things which helps other people to learn and understand and i don't know how much sense is going to make what i'm going to tell you but please try them because we've been trying these for the last 15 30 years and we have realized that they do help in the long term okay so this topic is called pre operative evaluation now the issue is this question is uh, why are we talking about this is because it's a big issue it's not a, a small if you see the number of patients one to 15 in 10000 live births will have a pediatric cataract and a pediatric cataract is totally totally curable thing if you can pack, pick it up early operate this patient put an implant glasses whatever but if you leave them alone they going to be blind that is for sure so that's because of this in mind the who says that if you operate a blind child it's better than treating an adult because you helping around 10 adults is equal to one child okay we did a study about this was uh, uh, about i think 8 9 years back in which we got the data from the lens clinic the abnormal uh, lenticular changes which the children came out with and we thought of we saw about 1047 patients we saw and what we noticed was the developmental cataract was in about 45% of these patients traumatic was about 30 so traumatic cataract is the one which is the most unfortunate because these are totally preventable because if the the kids are playing with crackers or the bow and arrow and somebody supervising they can definitely save these eyes but once they have a perforated injury the visual prognosis actually goes very bad and the third one which i'm trying to show you here is the last one which is a visual exo pacification that means somebody has seen the cataract and done the surgery but has not done it properly so about 7% will still go blind if they don't follow this patient so dictum is to do the surgery evaluate well and keep following these kids up for at least for 10 years i think the dictum should be at least for 10 years okay so the story starts basically with the parent counseling and the eye examination of the parents now why is important because the parent walks in and says doc why is my kid having a cataract and isn't the cataract a problem of an adult or a, a senile or a grown up person so we have to tell them no there is a certain subset in which the pediatric cataract happens and those are actually increasing in number 20 years back we used to get about 4 to 5 in a week now we get about a 15 in a lens clinic every week so that means it's really going up what is the reason maybe this being referred to us or maybe people are picking up early but at my center we getting more patient three times more than what we used to get about a 10 15 maybe 20 years back I give the mission of the child. Since I'm sitting in the hospital bed, we don't charge anything to the patient. The only thing I charge the patient is that both the parents will come and I'll dilate the pupil and I'll do a distant direct for both the parents. Then only I'll start seeing this patient and I'm very rigid about it. Even if the one parent has come, I'll call the other patient, parent the next time because I want to see what is the pattern. Where, where are we going? Is the mother, father having a uh, cataract or not? Because lots of patient nans for runs are being picked up now because of this. and proper systemic examination in these patients is important and i'll i'll just i think rush through the uh, thing so what you need to know in in the pediatric age group first is whether it's a lenticular change or it's a leukocoria because of cornea or behind the lens then against the red glow you see the size of the cataract the site of the cataract if it is off the center you don't have to bother if the size is less than 3 mm or maybe 2.5 mm you still can do a refraction and get away whether it's a unilateral bilateral and all the associated oculars and systemic findings which i'll be telling you soon okay so if you see anterior to the lens the corneal apertures and uh, and uh, corneal opacities and in case you are able to see it's good if the child is too small you're not able to see best is to put these uh, children under anesthesia examination and be very sure before you actually put in the blade for the surgery because if it's a phpv or a thing at the back or a toxocara you have to put a retinal guy uh, on the lookout so this plus all the investigation ultrasound is a must in this patient first you see the pupillary reaction of the patient then put ultrasound for this patient and try to see all these patients and how do you see i'll be telling you in a little while so let's start here now 
Now, this is a patient in which you have to assess the vision. Visual assessment is very important. Now, you see this child was operated both eyes, had a pseudofacus with a glass on the top, and he's so happy to see the vanishing optotype. So this is the uh, Cardiff chart, which will disappear at a distance and will come at a certain, certain distance. The moment the child sees it, he, he, he gets excited. So we know that he can see. Okay. Now, this is a second example. All these cases of cataract, you try to cover one eye and cover the other eye. You see, he won't let you cover one of the eyes. Better vision eye, he will not let you cover. The movements are very important in this patient. If you see this patient now, he's got a total white cataract. He's very comfortable in mother's uh, father's lap. It's, it's facing fr in front. Now you notice the eye, they're rotating on the z-axis. It's going to x-axis, y-axis. So there's not a particular pattern in this one. So we expect that this patient, now you see it starts getting the pendular movements also, when it's trying to fixate and we, uh, it takes the eye into the ESO. Look at that, now it's happening. So the, he's got all kinds of patterns. So I've showed you this one because always record. And after the surgery or first eye, record again. And after the second eye surgery, record again. And then after six months, they come back, he's doing a face off. You must have seen that movie in which uh, John Travolta and uh, this guy is there. So Nicholas Cage, they're doing the face off. So that's it. So this is a very important thing because we realize that the, the, the amplitude of the uh, nystagmus reduces after the cataract. It never goes away. It always stays, but it reduces. Now that's another one now. If you see the eye, where is the eye? If you put a scale from the superior bone orbit to the inferior orbit, you can't touch the even the lashes because it's gone deep in. So he's actually rubbing the eye. So this is a case of octodigital phenomena in which we didn't expect good, good vision. But on evaluation, you see he's following the light so well. So this patient actually got good vision after the surgery. So even if the eye is sunken with the octodigital phenomena, please don't write them off. Always give them a chance. And that's what a Bruckner's reflex is. You can see a glow in one eye and a cataract in the other eye. Okay, I go to the next one now. Okay, all right. Okay, now this was the paper we published in which we said the best way to put the child is on the mother's shoulder facing backwards because the entire body of the child is in contact with the mother and the child is comfortable. We realize that they're crying when they're looking front. The moment you turn them around, it's as good as seeing as a slit lamp. So any kids who less than six months, you do this one. Six months to one year, they can you can see them anywhere. Uh, uh, people who are less than three months who are not holding the head, you can put them flat and do it. Okay, and bigger than that, you can put them slit lamp. Right. Now see, this is a bilateral cataract, white, whitish and grayish look fine. Now this guy also was referred to me by, as a bilateral cataract, but the moment you put an ultrasound, we saw there was an RD in both eyes, so we had to refer to the retina people. The lenses are clear in this patient. Now notice this one. This is a patient in which there's a leukocoria, but it's a shifting leukocoria. It's not staying in one position. You can see the glow, and the other moment you see the glow going away. So that means whatever is there is mobile. So if it's mobile, it could be a subluxated lens if you're not able to see properly, that's a guess. Second is something at the back behind the lens. That's where the movements are going opposite. You know, you see at certain areas, the eye is absolutely fine. So this patient was a patient of ROP bilateral. Now you see at this end video, the both eyes having good glow. So don't be in a hurry to operate these patients. Okay, so ocular associations could be any, you can see this list, I think there could be many. So if you find a unilateral cataract, always look, in the eye for the problem. The eye will tell you what is the problem. Whereas the bilateral, you have to look at the systemic problems. The systemic uh, conditions will cause bilateral cataract by and large, maybe say 99%. And ocular will be seen only and only in unilateral, but yes, you can sometimes get in, bi in bilateral also. Okay. So systemic association could be a torch infection, the infection which is common, we know about rubella. Then you have glectosemia and let's, I think, run through it. Now, this is the second thing which we added on, which we're not, we're not doing earlier, which started about 10 years back. We do a head circumference of these kids and measure it. Now, in, in, according to the pediatric uh, uh, people, Indian Academy of Pediatrics, the guideline is that if it's less than one standard deviation small, we call it small head circumference. But if it's less than two standard deviations smaller, then it becomes microcephaly. And we found about uh, a large number of patients in our set, uh, subset uh, who had microcephaly, but they didn't have any, any uh, rubella or anything. So we can have patients with smaller heads and have cataract. And there's so many condition combination, we still don't have any names to that. But yes, if you get a cataract, please always measure the head circumference. It makes a difference to the follow-up. And you can uh, look at this picture now. This is a, a rubella, a typical small head. Now, this patient looks normal, but the head is big. So he was hydrocephalus and he was actually put a shunt later on. Okay, one coming to the to familiar syndromes. One minute to go. Okay, so, all right, so 
So the commonest syndrome is Down syndrome. You can have all these funny syndromes coming down the thing. But this is one of the NANS for you have to see the mother. Mother is a carrier. She, she can have a, a blue a cataract, a sutural cataract, but the vision usually is normal. So the kids do have a antiverted panna like uh, like a PK movie uh, guy, and uh, that's how the cataracted mother looked like. Now this was a patient with the Hunerman syndrome. One limb has gone small. I think I'll just jump through this. Don't everybody knows glyptosomia. If you have a jaundice and the failure to thrive at birth and a cataract, chances are it, it, it's a glyptosomia. Please always overdiagnose it and ask the pediatrician to have a look and get the enzymes uh, checked in these patients. Okay, then. Uh, Genetics is important. We found uh, two new loci recently, and uh, this is what the lenses look like. So the ones which in which you can do a refraction, you can get away and you can keep following this patient up. The ones in which, like this was a, a, a mother's eye in one of the patients. She has good vision, but there was a cataract which was in the periphery. And you can get all these funny cataracts. Yeah, you have to see the morphologies. And there are certain sir? set of morphologies which tell you. Yeah, okay. So... So the most important thing for you people to do is to do a EUA. In EUA, what you're supposed to do is, you're supposed to do a measurement of the white to white in these patients. If the white to white is, corneal diameter is less than nine millimeter, you're not putting a lens and do an exit lens. And everything has to be calculated on the table. So you have to have a good inventory of the IOLs. You should have an inventory of the IOLs, three piece lenses, single piece lenses, then only you should do these surgeries. Otherwise, I don't think you should be jumping into the fray because you might be having a problem with that. So I'll just run up this one and once, you're done, you can actually do a UVM in these patients. And we had done a study on the UVM in which we found that there are lots of peculiar findings which find with the UVMs. And these are the few of those ones which I'm just rushing through. And at the end, I'd like to say that if you're putting IOL in an in, in Indian setup, I think you should not put lens if the eye is less than 17 millimeter in exilent, white to white less than nine millimeter. For the nine, more than five years, it put no under correction, or maybe two percent. And for the two years, do five percent under correction. And this is a normogram which we have published, and this is what is more applicable for Asian eyes. And uh, and that's about it. So just to finalize, summarize, uh, comprehensive history of the parents and the eye checkup is very important. Ocular systemic examinations are very important. Basic examination biometry has to be done at EUA table time because you can't afford to have any error because if anyone is going to do under correction, if there's an error and you add on more error to that, it's going to actually magnify the problems. And tailor-made investigation, not for all, investigation for all, and clean surgery and blue treatment and follow-up. Thank you very much. Sorry, Thank you, Dr. Koka. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi logging in first. First, because he's still remaining. Sure, and meanwhile, I'll we can have any questions for Dr. Koka. Yeah, sure. Sure. If you have questions, I'm ready to answer, please. Sir, I have a question, yeah. sir. So, uh, for an isolated non-familial cases, uh, what's your practice for genetic uh, analysis and genetic workup? Ma'am, please log on. No, we're not doing it. We're not doing anything for those patients. See. We did a study in which we wanted to send the genetic uh, investigation for most of the patients. So we started picking a bilateral, the one in which has a family history. So we sent about a 50 patient to the genetic lab, and those people sent us a sticker saying that we need more money to investigate. Ideally speaking, bilateral with one uh, family member, senior, uh, parent, one of the parents involved, and you should do a genetic. But because of the cost factor, we're doing it, and especially the isolated unilateral ones, no way. Thank you so much, sir. We have Dr. Vijayakshma ready with our slides. So we can go to madam. Yeah. Sure. Madam, unmute. Yes. Yeah, we can hear yes. you now. Yeah, Sorry please, for the uh, delay. Um, uh, let us start. In the, uh, uh, thank you, Prachi and other organizers for this. And uh, it's a very, it has become a very passionate subject for me now, uh, recently. And let us see in another few minutes, I'll try to stick on to the time, about the significance of this cerebral visual impairment and uh, what are the areas involved in the brain and how that affection helps, I mean, affects the uh, visual perceptions. And also the methodology, what we have adopted in the Institute to examine these children and planning the interventions. So, When, uh, to introduce, I mean, when uh, uh, there was a registry published by uh, the uh, uh, by Kansas City USA, predicting that the cerebral visual impairment for them was 25% between the age group of zero to three years. This prompted us to look into our uh, data, which also confirmed that uh, the uh, uh, almost a little bit 1% more than what uh, they have 
almost equaling their uh, data. So this is the significance I think all of us should remember. And this can be attributed to the increased pediatric eye care throughout the country. And I assume the same data should be valid for all the regions in the country. So the intricacy can be understood if you uh, try to read the words here. You, an insured adult should be able to read the words correctly in spite of the messing up letters in between the uh, first and the last alphabets. So the intricacy of the brain perception is so much. So how is it? This can be explained the way uh, as follows. The, uh, it is said that 70% of the uh, sensory receptors are placed in the eye. And this in association with the 50% of the brain is able to perceive any visual scene by one tenth of a second. And thus, the eye along with the brain acts as the most sensitive organ in the body, transmitting 90% of the visual uh, uh, see, scene and also helping in retaining 80% of what it has been learned by visual. So what is CVI? This is mostly an interpretation of the uh, misinterpretation of the visual world, especially on what things are and where they are located. And though, as I said, the uh, importance lies in the uh, uh, more uh, change in the uh, scenario of the visual causes in the visual causes in the uh, causes of uh, visual impairment in children. But it is not well understood among the professionals who deal these children, and hence this often goes undetected or unrecognized. To understand a little bit more what is happening in the brain, if you see here, once the image gets formed in the occipital lobe, the information is transmitted via two main pathways called ventral and dorsal. The ventral stream connects the occipital lobe to the temporal lobe, and this is responsible for our recognition of objects, faces, colors, and shapes, and also the location where we are. And uh, the dorsal pathway connects it to the posterior uh, parietal cortex, motor, and frontal cortexes. And this is responsible for our visual um, uh, recognition and the search and the eye-hand coordination movements. And in short, we can say the ventral stream, ventral or what stream, it can be compared to the hard disk of our computer and the dorsal stream to the uh, software. So as you see here, you can see the real act of this uh, child where uh, consciously she recognizes the um, object as what she holds in her hand as an apple, and she decides to color it. Once she has decided, she searches for a red pencil, and then she tries to locate it, and the whole body helps her in going and searching and taking, picking up the pencil from the uh, uh, table. So this act is not a simple one. It's a complicated one, but it is made simple by the coordination of the eyes and the brain. So these different areas, I will know how these different areas of the uh, brain, what I showed, causes different affections in the visual perceptions. So accept the lobe, which is the main thing. That we see the, the receptors from the central part of the retina, which is parvocellular region, and it is responsible for the clarity of the image, color perception, and identification objects. So in if this gets affected, you see a, a blurred vision and also causes a central a field defect along with difficulty in perceiving colors. So what about the next? The ne middle temporal bone, I mean, this is responsible for the motion perception. So it is slightly a little anterior. And this motion perception is important as it is even when the occipital lobe is involved, these children will have a, some sort of blind sight. That, that means they will be able to perceive things that are at least fast moving in spite of having difficulties in other functions. So it is possible that we can stimulate this area even when the occipital cortex is completely gone. 
we can stimulate and give them some kind of ambulatory vision. So what about this ventral pathway? As we said, this acts as a visual library helping in all these uh, recognitions. So what happens when this is affected? You lose identifying, you lose the capacity of identifying the objects and faces, also the emotions, difficult recognizing it, and also you are lost in the crowd. Even sometimes children may not be able to identify even their own parents in the crowd. That is the importance of the ventral pathway. So the nasal pathway, as I said, that is very uh, important in visual recognition, searching and then movements. When that is classed, you will lose the conscience of locating the object and then picking up exactly what you want. And you bump into places and you have also difficulty in copying in the board. So how do we examine these children? As a routine examination, anti-segment, post-segment should be done. But a special emphasis should be on checking their accommodation, refraction, and the vision assessments. So this child, if you see her carefully, uh, she was a two-year-old with a, a hypothesis ischemic encephalitis sequelae, referred to us as suspicion of particle blindness. If you have seen earlier, she was having difficulty not looking at the red color outfit. But once we gave the glasses, she was able to see it. It is even by simple dynamic retinoscopy, we can assess this accommodation, which invariably, most of the time, it's poor in this case. And by giving them this small power, we can increase the correction in them, clarity in them. And then what is this cognitive or functional vision? This is the ability of the brain to see the image, to perceive what is seen by the eyes. If the brain doesn't perceive what the eyes see, even having a good visual acuity is of no use to us. So we have developed a protocol in examination of uh, these children, and then we follow the same uh, schedule. So what we uh, use is usually we use uh, either a fixation, a mirror, or a smiley to check the capacity of uh, ability of holding the fixation for longer, or use a different sized rectangles to check the size, shape, and also the width of the uh, rectangles. Or uh, there is one uh, is missing that where uh, you see uh, uh, the use the LIA board for checking the shapes and a simple a mailbox, a homemade mailbox. And this gives us how the child is oriented to the uh, directions. And uh, uh, also use a regular puzzle, whatever is available in the market, to check their uh, sequencing. And then multiple emoticons, whatever is available, can be projected in the TV screen or the computer. And then different emotions, like your uh, anger, fear, sad, happy, this can be assessed. Usually the autism children, and they have difficulty in emotion perceptions. And the crowding phenomenon can be checked with the array of different objects. And the contrast sensitivity, we use uh, LIA cards again uh, to check their ability to see in the low contrast levels. And this video demonstrates it's a, a child with the autism. They see how uh, uh, difficult, sometimes it's easy, but some most of the time she finds it difficult to uh, do all the things. This is for seconds and first is moment. It's also very uh, important to check in these uh, children because most of them are, have very poor uh, seconds and pursuits. And just by simply training their moments, we can improve them. See, she knows that there is something to be matched, but doesn't know which to be, where to be convinced. So, and uh, with all these uh, hardware difficulties, recently, two, three years ago, uh, the Arvind team, along with the uh, team from a software company from Mindtree, developed uh, an app which is which can check very easily with the play mode that all the things what I explained earlier can be seen in a uh, app, uh, app. And this is what Ma'am, we cannot hear you. The video is not available. Oh, it's the audio. I am, I am sorry. This is uh, mainly 
this um, apart from other thing this is also can be used for training in the activities where we have found the difficulty and that mode can be trained at home by whatsapp or in play store in the um, uh, anywhere and what is this rehabilitation this rehabilitation is a word that we should use as either we recover upon a recovery of an ability or you develop an ability which is not there that should be our aim in uh, talking about rehabilitation so the simple things usually earlier we never used to give glasses because the, for many uh, factors but if, if you give glasses a pair of glasses if they even if there is a small refractive error definitely that makes their life easier by looking uh, having a good clarity and on the whole we have seen the social behavior is changed with the pair of glasses and supposing simple the inferior field defects how do we detect it by simply making them walk with the clutter uh, background then we will see they will just uh, uh, tumble on and then they walk so what can we do to improve their uh, 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 inferior field defects so this can be done just by uh, either giving a contrast threshold like a shoes here or you um, give a stroller with the supra threshold where you ask them to the video is not and you have a minute to uh, it is not seen or you give a, a supra threshold illumination so that they can screen sharing is soft way Resume share. Yes. The shared window is closed. Why is coming like the shared window is closed? I cannot see your screen now. You have to just reshare the screen again. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. Uh, I have a very good uh, uh, example of cases. Huh? We don't know your screen sharing. Open your presentation, ma'am. We can see your screen. Uh, your your uh, things are there obstructing my uh, opening. Your photos, uh, videos are there. Rachi, can you uh, uh, take over your, your video so that I can find my PowerPoint? Can you take out your picture from the screen? My picture, I cannot take out. Tech team, can you just help? Okay, I will minimize it. Oh, okay, I will just coming, coming, coming. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We can see you on your screen. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Full screen, you are seeing? It's just coming, ma'am. Not yet. Yes. Do you have only videos to show or you have some? Yeah, we, I have some uh, special uh, uh, cases to uh, show you. It will be very interesting. So it's not maybe... Can we start the next and then come back to you? I think to finish so. those cases? I think so. Yeah. I think so. You can start with because the time. So we will have uh, Dr. Simar. Uh, in, uh, he will be speaking on the best of the best video. Uh, that video, cataract videos. So it's basically filling for filling in for Dr. Jagat Ram, who cannot be with us today. So Dr. Simar, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir. On behalf of Professor Jagat Ram, I would like to thank uh, Professor Lahane, Professor Ragni, and the executive of Boa for this opportunity. Uh, 
I will be presenting Sir's video on management of cataract associated with persistent hyperplasia. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Best of the best award at the uh, uh, American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery Annual Conference 2016 in New Orleans. It has a voiceover, and so you can understand it there. In this video, we describe the management of cataract associated with persistent hypoplastic primary vitreous. The producers have no financial interest in the subject matter of this film. Persistent hypoplastic primary vitreous is a congenital anomaly in which the hyaline vasculature persists beyond fetal life. In cases of interior PHPV with visual axis obscuration, Surgical outcomes have been dismal. The presence of a dense vascularized membrane behind the lens can lead to potentially disastrous complications like intraoperative bleeding, sometimes even requiring abandoning the surgery. We describe a surgical technique for the management of such cases to obtain a favorable visual outcome. After making a continuous curvilinear capsular excess, the cortical material is aspirated out. The persistent fetal vessels are then cauterized in a circular fashion to obtain an avascular cleavage plane. The membrane is cut along this cleavage plane with vertical micro scissors creating a posterior capsulotomy. The stalk with the halide vessels is cauterized and cut along with a limited anterior vitrectomy. The IOL can then be safely implanted in the capsular bag. With these surgical principles in mind, let's take a look at some real-life scenarios we face in children with PHPV. First is a 3-year-old child who presented with a limited anterior PHPV obscuring the visual axis with a classical stalk. Indirect ophthalmoscopy revealed a normal retina with the stalk attached to the disc. The axial length was 18.3 mm. After making the side and main port incisions, a continuous curvilinear capsular excess is completed using a Utrata's forceps. Then the soft cortical material is aspirated out by irrigation and aspiration. A primary posterior capsulotomy is performed around the attachment of the stalk. The hyaline vessels in the stalk are cauterized followed by a limited anterior vitrectomy. In view of the large posterior capsulotomy, IOL is implanted in the ciliary sulcus with capture of the optic in the rex's margins. The viscoelastic material is aspirated and the ports are sutured. The second scenario is a 6 month old child with a diffuse white cataract. Ultrasonography revealed the presence of a stalk extending between the optic disc and the lens suggesting the diagnosis of PHPV and an axial length of 17 mm. The interior capsule is stained with profan blue dye and a continuous curvilinear capsular excess is made. The cortical lens material is aspirated out with the irrigation and aspiration cannula. This reveals the densely vascularized membrane with the stalk being visualized here on retro elimination. The persistent fetal vessels on the membrane are cauterized with the help of an endocautery to create an avascular plane. 
vertical micro scissors are then used to cut through this membrane 360 degrees thus creating a posterior capsulotomy. The same endocautery is used to cauterize the hyalide vessels in the stalk and the remnants of the membrane are taken out after an anterior vitrectomy to release vitreous traction. A corresponding anterior and posterior capsulorexis can be visualized here. The single piece intraocular lens is then implanted into the capsular bag. As PHPV is mostly unilateral, an IOL placement is desirable because unilateral aphakia is as strong a stimulus for amblyopia as the primary pathology itself. The third scenario is that of a two-year-old child presenting with a densely vascularized membrane with large prominent ciliary processes. The initial steps of surgery are carried out in a similar fashion. A continuous curvilinear capsular excess can be particularly difficult in such cases due to the thin and lax nature of the capsule. The persistent fetal vessels in the membrane are cauterized in a confluent pattern to create an avascular cleavage zone. A posterior capsulotomy is made by cutting through this newly created avascular zone with micro scissors aided with the help of intraocular forceps. Care should be taken to not cut through this thin stalk of fetal vessels at this stage. After completing the posterior capsulotomy, the fetal vessels in the stalk are cauterized and the anterior vitrectomy is completed to obtain a clear visual access. An IOL can then be implanted into the capsular bag. Postoperatively, these eyes should be managed on higher frequency of topical steroids along with antibiotics and cycloplegics. Residual refractive error, if any, should be corrected and intensive amblyopia therapy initiated. Children with PHPV require a long-term follow-up to monitor for visual access opacification, glaucoma, and posterior segment complications. To conclude, cataract associated with PHPV is a challenging situation. However, by following the basic surgical principles as demonstrated here, a favorable outcome can be achieved in a majority of these children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sima. Uh, we will have uh, Nane sir now for his, uh, for his uh, tips and tricks in pediatric cataract. Sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I will... Uh, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simar. Thank you, you. Thank you for allowing you to present on Sir's behalf. It was a pleasure. No, no, I understand Sir is very busy and with COVID and it is very, very understandable. But thank you so much for you being here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Vijay Lakshmi, madam. I think uh, someone's presentation is seen there. Ma'am, uh, you need to unshare ah, your screen. Some, ah, you will have to Someone's presentation is in, so I cannot. Vijay Lakshmi, madam, you have to un uh, unshare your screen. Yes. It is, is it in upper. Yes, your is screen is visible. Yeah, your PPT is visible, ma'am. We will have uh, Nani sir's uh, presentation, then we'll follow up with yours. Okay, okay. Okay. Yes. To un unshare your screen, ma'am. Yeah, we can see you, sir. Ma thank you, thank you. Okay. Now I will share my screen. Uh, Uh. 
So it's at the bottom of your screen. Uh-huh. It's at the bottom of the screen, the share screen part. Uh, it is there, but... Uh, it open your PPT first. Uh, I have opened my PPT. And now... But how to share it? So at the bottom of the panel, there is a share screen green button with arrow up, pointing up. One minute, see. Okay, share, share. Okay. Now this is a uh, coming. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Can you see now? Yeah. Yes, sir. We can see your slides. No, okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Asis. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, uh, Thank you, Vijaya Lakshmi, madam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ragini. Now, this is a prayer tricks, uh, tips and tricks. I'm going to speak to you. Uh, you see, the there is no financial disclosure, but you can see the pediatric uh, cataract article. What says it accounts for the 7 to 15 percent of the cataract blindness is uh, is uh, pediatric blindness is due because of the cataract. And if you see the refractive error cause, 33% of the visual impairment is caused by the uh, periatric cataract. So now there are so many, this one, when to operate. So bilateral dense cataract, if it is there, early surgery at eight weeks or uh, is to prevent development of the stimulus deprivation amblyopia. The second eye is to be operated within a one week. Unilateral dense cataract, uh, urgent surgery is advised and best if it's done four to six weeks because the patient will not go into the amblyopia. Now, what is the difference between the adult eye and the pediatric eye? You see, it is a smaller anterior chamber depth, the stiffer cornea, shorter axial length, lower corneal and scleral visibility, well-formed uterus, soft lens, very elastic anterior capsule. See the IOL power calculation. See the roughly I'm telling you that the children Less than two years of age, do biometry and undercorrect by 20%. And children between two to eight years do biometry, undercorrect by 10%. Now, the uh, this is the intumescent cataract. I am just showing you the video. You can see this is, uh, I am operating. And uh, this cataract, here I am doing the rexis. And you will see the cataract as a whole comes out. And then it is very difficult now, see, to do the rexis. So I'm trying, but because the uh, now everything is lost. So I, what I'm doing is now I use the AC maintainer always. So I will go into the AC maintainer and then I will aspirate. And after the this, the aspiration, then I am doing the rexis because of the intumescence, the cataract was coming out. And then I did the rexis. Now, when I have done the rexis, see, in these uh, uh, cases, the rexis, sometimes, you know, the anterior capsule is very elastic. So, it is very difficult to do the rexis. So, you have to do very by the forceps and uh, go slow so that you can do the proper rexis. Now, here I have, I'm just aspirating the cortex from all over. I use the AC maintainer and I do the uh, PCCC up to the six years of age and do the vitrectomy. So here, after doing this uh, PCCC, I do the proper vitrectomy. And then here you will see the, just showing the another patient here, the PCCC is done. And the I'm using the four shape here. And uh, here you will see the capsule is very, very elastic whenever you are pulling it. We always feel that all the capsule is coming, but here the elasticity, you have to go slow. As you have seen that I'm going slowly and making a rexis. This rexis, it should be equal to the pupillary size or slightly larger than the pupillary size, the pupillary size that I'm making. And here the, the rexis is completed, posterior rexis, then I will do the vitrectomy. And after vitrectomy, then the I will is this is uh, implanted. Now with this, see this is the 
cataract you can see the totally you can see absorbed cataract here it is not uh, in the periatric cataract now you see i am doing the rexis and you see the all capsule is coming with me whenever the i am taking the needle the capsule is coming in because of the absorption this capsule is uh, you can say elastic more and loosen so i am trying to do the rexis you will see the anterior capsule is also having the calcification and also the uh, opacification in the anterior capsule now here on one side if i am coming there is a fibrotic band on the anterior capsule and i am unable to remove that band if and this tag which is the which is fibrous area in that anterior capsule that you will get in the uh, such type of cases so so you should be particular whenever you are removing such type of tag so that you will not bring the uh, zonules and there may be a uh, pc tear so what i do i always use the cutter with this cutter here you will let you will have to protect the iris otherwise sometimes we may, we may uh, cut the iris now again after that i am doing the pccc here in the pccc also whenever you can see the same thing that you go gradually and after the gradual pccc see here and then i will go for the uh, cutter uh, this uh, vitreotomy and once the vitreotomy is complete so here it should be complete vitreotomy and then only you can go for the uh, uh, even this one the another case i am going to show is the periatic cataract uh, yes traumatic cataract this injury due to the ball and i am doing this uh, rexis here you will see it is on the anterior capsule you can see there is a fibrosis seen in the center so carefully the rexis to be done otherwise it goes in the periphery and it is very difficult to complete the rexis so i have completed the rexis and then the what i will do will, will be you can see the aspirate the cortex so this cortex as you see it is in the center as there was a trauma in the posterior capsule also there is a fibrosis and i was unable to do it by the forceps so i am doing pccc by the cutter only so here i am doing and area where it was a fibrosis that i am cutting with the uh, vitrector and see here and the the extension of the uh, pccc also i am doing with the vitrector so here you will see this is i am cutting and the uh, rexis on whatever the fibrosis is there in the posterior capsule that i am trying to remove and once that is done then i have implanted the lens and the uh, surgery is finished so i think this is what i do in the conclusion what i want to say is periatic cataract is a preventable blindness you can prevent it only thing is that uh, one should not uh, operate each and every person should not operate that it is a cataract and any cataract surgeon can operate this no periatic cataract is totally different from the uh, our senile cataract the meticulous preoperative workup is very very important anterior vitreotomy with the pccc in all children is important less than 5 i will calculation by repeated measurements from the experimental ophthalmologist this ex experience ophthalmologist I, and i think this you should do personally instead of asking someone to do you should do personally and uh, close follow up and visual rehabilitation is very important because you have operated the kid you have not implanted the eye well so that may cause the amblyopia in both eyes so it should be a close follow up so thank you very much for the thank you so much sir as as usual we had a lot to learn from you thanks a lot thank you sir thank you thank you very much thank you Uh, if you are ready with your slides, uh, with your presentation, as as is, you will have yes, to excuse sir. me and continue this uh, because I have joined the Facebook uh, live of Honorable Sam Sir. So I will be going there. So Vijay Lakshmi Sir, I am sorry. So I will be joining there. Huh? Thank you so much, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Krishna, mm -hmm. we can have your a minute. for your slides if you have time you are ready with it if you are not ready then we can go ahead and take up the next presentation ma'am we cannot hear you ma'am
I am ready with the slides. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, madam. Yes. Yes. So, uh, only I just wanted to uh, emphasize the younger generation that we have come so much forward in uh, treating uh, diseases, and it is a high time that we should concentrate on this part. Uh, 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 these children, where if we could do a much, we can do a lot. Uh, much to these uh, children if we identify them early and then uh, do a correct uh, uh, intervention for them. So that is why I just wanted to share this uh, uh, thing uh, about uh, rehabilitation. So when you have this uh, field uh, of, uh, um, thing, you can either have a, a super threshold uh, shoes or one with the uh, 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 scroll where you can train them to look at it to attract the uh, illuminated one. There is a very nice device is available in the markets that can be uh, done there. And then this is a child, uh, seven year old, uh, was uh, came to us with the uh, vision 66 N6, but with all these complaints from the uh, mother, saying unable to uh, do the academic work and a problem in motility, mobility and also identifying dropped objects, all those things. So when we examined, we found a, a, a similar a problem with the simultagnosia. This video, we have simulated the video simultagnosia. If you show her the solid, the star, she was able to identify it. But when it is shown with multiple rounds around, then she had difficulty in locating the star. This is a simultagnosia, and this can be uh, tackled very easily. Uh, by intervening, by making the visual array uh, a little bit uh, a simple one using a single uh, card, letter card, instead of a crowded one, or using a reading guide with the elim eliminate, illuminating only a single letter, or make the child to move closer to a, a object where she is interested to look into. So that will magnify and then she will be able to see. All these things need only an inter only a, a proper counseling and little bit training. And another 11 year old came to us with a poor eye contact, behavior problem, and also poor academic performance, poor attention in, in general. And then main thing was uncomfortable around moving stimuli and traffic. So when we examined the vision was okay, everything was okay, but it was uncomfortable because this, when we check the eye movements, the circuits and pursuits were not normal. Because of the difficulty in eye movement matching the environment, she had difficulty in uh, motion perception. That is uh, about moving objects, fast moving objects, or a ball. So she could not play with her uh, mates, everything. So these children will do better with the stationary ones. And also, if we teach them without moving or with the static materials, that will help a lot in this small modification, but help them to uh, uh, do ex uh, well in the academics. And we all know that many children, especially the autism spectrum disorder, have difficulty in recognizing emo emotions. And this can be uh, trained by using uh, emoticons, what, as what you see. But in the school, what the complaint of academic performance a simple use of a bold pencil or a marker pencil or a lined one or asking the child to go closer to the board, that will help a lot. That why this becomes important, even with the little ambulatory vision is much helpful in a child with a profound visual impairment. So for that, we need a great assessment and early identification because these children uh, have a different uh, perspective, different sign, they show different clinical signs depending upon the pathology. So we need to examine each child for their own capacities as an individual basis to plan the intervention. So what is it? We have come so much forward in treating the diseases, cataracts, or other. We are very good in making the eyes aligned in difficult situations. But this said, as I said, importance is 26% of visual impairment are due to now. This is because more and more premies are surviving with the morbidities. So with the uh, allied personnel, we identify these children 
with the simple questionnaire what are prepared by um, uh, to identify early this the, about walking problems or seeing moving things difficulty or whenever whatever is pointed out the child is not able to point out these five questions if we employ we can screen these children and once we screen it we should be able to uh, intervene them at least to give a better quality of life and uh, uh, i am sure this is going to be uh, a great significant problem in future i think all of us should be aware and then try to um, do uh, uh, examine or give importance to these children to improve their quality of life thank you very much for giving me time thank you so very much madam certainly can we have uh, dr kavita kalaiwani for uh, presentation she will be speaking on challenges and tips to manage traumatic cataract she is a consultant in pediatric ophthalmology at shankarnathalay chennai thank you thank you dr ashish and uh, ma'am you need to stop sharing ma'am oh, 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 oh sorry you're still sharing your screen ma'am go ahead dr kavita yeah so um as with all pediatric uh, cataract situations traumatic cataract imposes extra challenges so i'll try to summarize what uh, how we uh, step by step how we approach and uh, try to give some tips so any traumatic cataract there is the first aim is to manage the trauma like this first is to restore the globe integrity when we are the primary surgeons so then the visual axis has to be cleared then optical correction and amblyopia in children so trauma uh, typically is blunt trauma can present in various scenarios in various situations like this so you can have intact cornea if the injury is not so severe total cataract iris issues can be there like sphincter or uh, dialysis stability of the lens might be doubtful posterior capsular status might be doubtful angle injuries has to be looked into and posterior uh, segment issues can also be associated whereas penetrating trauma is more of corneal trauma again capsular integrity iris injury all this has to be looked into so we have different scenarios based on when how and we see how to manage and along with what to manage so the issues involved in cataract management in the, in trauma situation is do we manage the cataract if there is cataract while we have uh, faced the primary repair itself and if we don't do it during the primary repair is there a time uh, with the, you know time gap where between the trauma and the cataract surgery ideal time gap and if iol is planned implantation is planned whether do we do it primarily or secondarily and where do we implant the iol the position uh, depending on availability of the intactness of the structures and additional procedures whether an iris uh, repair is required glaucoma surgery is required vitrectomy is required or not so these are the issues we need to face and of course face patient counseling so different scenarios present uh, like this in children Uh, making the issues complicated because of their age and the time at which they present so like i said the issue one cataract management do we ever do a cataract management during the primary repair so ideally uh no but why not so when there is an open globe it is an emergency state we may not have the best backup of instruments and uh, arrangement so availability of expertise may be doubtful and availability of uh, risk of infection inflammation all that is doubtful when we have an open globe so ideally we do not manage the cataract in the primary repair but sometimes yes we do have to manage so when is that when there is a breached anterior capsule obviously and there is a lens matter in age ac large chunks of lens matter and sometimes we do it to avoid multiple injuries in very small children and early, early rehabilitation is possible and we can assess the posterior segment better so cataract surgery during primary repair is ideally best avoided and done only if there is a large breach in the anterior capsule and lens matter in the ac so then iol implantation during primary repair do we ever do so you see these two scenarios so the second situation there is a very small penetrating injury but the capsule is ruptured nicely and lens matter is in the ac so here the uh, rupture in the small tear in the cornea is actually not in the visual axis and it's a little older child so maybe in this second situation we can plan a primary or at least we can have a backup 
if DBR and all is possible, and if there is no other necessary for a tight corneal wound and everything else is intact by posterior segment examination, maybe there is a small chance that we can implant the IOL in the primary situation. Otherwise, we usually never implant IOL in the primary cataract surgery, especially when the cornea is uh, breached. So best avoided due to chance of infection, of course, biometry issues. So if cataract is not managed during the primary repair, then when do we manage? So ideal time between trauma and cataract management. Is there anything like that? So when do we do it? Is always a doubt when it is uh, when the children present in different different uh, situations. So age, intraocular pressure, and inflammation determines the timing between the trauma and the cataract surgery. So here we see primary repair done two days prior elsewhere. But if you can see the eye is highly inflamed and cortex is in the anterior chamber. Uh, so we can do the primary repair. Uh, once the cornea is intact, we can do the cataract surgery by doing a lensectomy. So here the ish cornea is still having sutures. So only lensectomy to improve the inflammation and uh, IOP issues later. So when we do like this situation, we leave a capsular rim uh, intact, but clear the visual access completely, examine the posterior segment later and plan electively an IOL implantation as a secondary procedure after corneal sutures are removed. So different situations, different timing for cataract surgery and IOL implantation. So when we decide on IOL implantation, what type, when do we implant, if not in the primary situation and the power calculation issues arise. So when there is a corneal injury and primary repair has been done, so the, you do the cataract surgery, do a lensectomy or a contact lens and secondary IOL till we manage the, uh, till we decide about secondary IOL implantation. If there is a sutured cornea, you remove the sutures, wait for two to three weeks for the suture effect to heal and then uh, topography and then IOL implantation as a secondary procedure. So primary versus secondary, what factors decide is the posterior capsular status, age of the child, corneal sutures, etc. So when we, we place the IOL, uh, where? So that again depends on the integrity of the bag, sulcus, and so very, very rarely or extremely rarely we sometimes adopt ACOL, but ideally no in children. SFOL, glued IOL are the other options. So these are two situations where IOL is implanted, even if there is a traumatic cataract, the PC block is removed and intact. Kavita, you have a minute. There. And uh, the second situation parallelly, if you see, there is a traumatic cataract with a corneal opacity, but IOL can be implanted in the sulcus. So there are two options in the primary situation depending on the posterior capsular integrity. So non-cataractous role, sometimes, as I said, we can have cataract with other conditions like iridectomy, we might need to do optical uh, iridodialysis repair, we may have to do glaucoma surgery. So all this, we need a hand-in-hand -hand role and plan what to do along with cataract surgery itself. So this is one situation where a pupiloplasty is done along with the cataract surgery. And here an iridectomy is done because the corneal opacity is a little in the center to improve the visual axis, we can do an optical iridectomy while we plan the cataract surgery. So iridodialysis, ideally we do with when it is uh, one first you do the cataract surgery and after that you do the iridodialysis repair if we do it in the same sitting. So long term, it's a continuous challenge. Refractive challenges are always there. Amblyopia, glaucoma, retinal complications, strabismus, everything has to be managed. So finally, to take home, cataract management is best avoided at the time of primary repair, except in extremely rare situations. Ideal timing of cataract surgery following trauma is within one week to one month in adults and children. And amblyogenic age group, it's crucial to plan clearing the visual axis rather than implanting the IOL and important to weigh the risks of amblyopia due to aphakia and uncorrected astigmatism rather than DVR related issues. And primary implantation of IOL has proven to give best results whenever possible and concurrent issues whenever present can be tried to manage at the, uh, simultaneously. And very important to be aware of long-term issues like glaucoma complications and sympathetic ophthalmia even in children. And patient counseling goes hand in hand all along. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kavita. We, if we have time, we will take questions later. We now invite uh, Dr. Sujata Goa for her presentation on pediatric IOL calculations. Uh, she's a consultant and a medical director of Shankar Yatrala, Kolkata. Dr. Sujata, please go ahead.
Can you see my screen? Not yet. Just a question for Dr. Kavita in the meanwhile. Uh, are you there, Dr. Kavita? I'm here. Yeah, so in case you're planning to put an IOL in the same sitting, uh, how do you go about calculating the IOL power? That's what I see. Uh, in my uh, experience, in a situation where there is a corneal injury, we never probably, we hardly ever have a situation like that. But that particular child uh, was, which I showed had a very small corneal injury. Wonder how the capsule ruptured so much. So I just had a backup of uh, DBR done on table. We did DBR on table. And after just, we just needed to take one bite for that corneal wound. So I implanted IOL in that child alone. Otherwise, uh, in a... In a corneal injury, I've never had a situation where I could implant IOL in the primary setting. Thank you. Sujat, are you ready with your presentation? Yeah. Can you see my screen now? No, we cannot see your presentation. Okay. Then maybe Meanwhile, can we have Dr. Dr. Love ready for his uh, presentation? We are really running short of time, so we need to... Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, shall I? So, yeah, so ma'am, Sujata, madam, you'll have just, uh, you, if you can arrange your PPT, then we will have next one for you. Yeah, is my screen uh, visible? Yeah, he, uh, yes. So, so we have Dr. Love uh, from Kolkata. He's a director and senior consultant at Netralam. So Dr. Love, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll just uh, rush through a few of the surgical videos in uh, pediatric cataract. And uh, whenever I'm overshooting my time, just let me know. I'll stop it there. Yeah, please go ahead. So most, imp most important thing is we all should know what not to do. Because pediatric cataract is such a um, uh, surgical issue that everyone is who is doing adult cataract gets tempted to do it. And this is what happens when you're not trained properly. This was a case which was done uh, by an untrained surgeon and uh, a single piece IOL was placed in sulcus. The inferior iris is missing and uh, this has led to corneal decompensation part partially. So what we did, we removed the IOL and just lay, lay, left the child AFAK. First, we tried to um, bend the, um, the uh, fold the IOL and cut it, bring it out, but it didn't come out through the main incision. So we cut it into two pieces and finally explanted it. And more importantly, because uh, the iris is deficient on one side, we decided against implanting a secondary IOL. We left the child AFAK. And later on, when the eye became quiet, we put the child on a contact lens. So the, the purpose of showing this video is why everyone should not do it. Because this child who has a life of maybe 70, 80 years ahead of him and one eye is greatly compromised because of uh, untrained hand doing a pediatric cataract surgery. So second video is just for a uh, demonstration. How do we do the biometry in children? And uh, most, of the, uh, most of the cases, what we do, we keep a full series of IOL uh, with us and uh, do a biometry on table. As you can see here, we have not put the speculum because that causes uh, uh, the cornea to get distorted and the reading may not be proper. So with just opening the eye, we took the keratometry reading. And then do a A scan. So this is how we do the biometry. I'll go to the next one. Now this video is a com combination of uh, a routine cataract surgery with a small pupil in a child. And as you can see, we have used Grishaver hook here because again, more we manipulate the chances of uh, post-op inflammation, it will be much higher. So, and one, after, after making the in initial neck, it was a hypermature cataract. We did, uh, the milky fluid was removed and capsular excess completed.
purpose of showing this video is that two, three uh, situations are combined in one surgery. And as you can see, zonules were a bit weak. So the trepan blue has gone into the vitreous cavity. A, a three piece IOL is placed in the bag. And once it is in place, what we do now uh, on routine basis is use a, a 23 gauge cutter and uh, do a posterior capsular excess along with this. This is a old video in which the cut rate is less, but the newer machines, it is much more better than that. Now, this is another important thing, which is uh, when we have a child with a unilateral cataract, then we should always suspect a posterior lenticonus because almost 10% of these children have a posterior deficient posterior capsule. And we have to think, and this is a clear cut. As we can see, the oil droplet uh, is being seen at the posterior capsule. That is a point where the posterior capsule is deficient. So. By mistake, I started doing hydro dissection, but at the right time, I stopped it. Ideally, we should not do any hydro procedures, uh, start uh, aspirating the cortex from the periphery, and then finally go to the center where the capsule is deficient so that there is no vitreous loss. And if there is vitreous loss, we should stop there itself, remove the uh, uh, irrigation aspiration and go in with a cutter. And as you can see, the PC is deficient at this point. So what we did, we again treat it as an adult posterior polar cataract. So don't, uh, don't um, uh, release the hand PC immediately so that the AC gets uh, decompressed and then that, that leads, leads to a vitreous loss. Dr. Lord, again, this is here, last uh, minute. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this video there uh, in which this is another procedure what we do for infants and when we are not implanting IUL. In this, the, we don't go, uh, we don't make a ma main port. With the two side ports, uh, we, uh, the anterior capsular excess is done. Using the cutter itself, we aspirate the cortical uh, matter using IA. And... Uh, Finally, the posterior capsule is cut uh, and we leave a rim of anterior capsule uh, for future IOL implantation. I think due to uh, time constraint, I will stop at this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lam. That was very instructive. Can we have Dr. Sujada ready for a presentation? It is not allowing me to... Uh, yeah, it will come on, madam. Yeah, it will come um, you can do it now, I think. Yeah, I, I, I did it. See, I'm opening and I'm sharing it. It's not, it's not allowing me to do it. Uh, I don't know. I think, can you take over? Can you help in any way? Um, see, it is giving a privacy policy and I have said that uh, I'm, just give me two minutes. Sometimes you leave the meeting and join again, it helps. And with your permission, can we go ahead with the next presentation? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. So we'll have Dr. Jai Kalkar Kilkar from Pune. She will be speaking on capsular access techniques. So Dr. Jai there? Yes, I'm there. I'll start. Yeah, please go ahead, Jai. It's telling me that I cannot share while the other participant is sharing. So I think you'll have to stop sharing. Yeah. Are you sharing the screen? Can you please stop your sharing? Try again, Dr. I'll stop sharing. Can you still do it?
Well, just a question for Dr. Rav. Uh, so you were talking about doing an intraoperative uh, biometry. Uh, so do you prefer doing the uh, contact A-scan or do you, do you like going ahead with an immersion A-scan? So that is question number one. And question number two, are you comfortable operating in the same setting after doing a contact procedure? Uh, ideally, immersion should be done, but uh, in our uh, setup, it's not uh, available in the new machine. This was an old machine, and uh, I, uh, ideally speaking, it should be avoided. But in pediatric cataracts, uh, giving the putting the child into double GA is again another issue. I've been doing it for years now; it doesn't make any. Um, I've not seen any infection till now. Should I try to share my screen again? Yeah, please do that, ma'am. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. We can see your screen, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I will be speaking on an important topic, which may be more important than the surgical process itself. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, the pediatric IOL power calculation. And um, why is it different than that of adults? Because of the rapid refractive and anatomic change in ch uh, changes which occur in childhood. And uh, the anatomy per se of a child's eye is different. It has got a much shorter axial length much steeper uh, corneas and a smaller AC depth. So the challenges uh, uh, in doing a pediatric IL power calculation will be biometry, the selection of IL formulae, and the amount of undercorrection that we need to do. Let me tackle with the biometry first. Now, why is it that the biometry is so challenging? It is because we do it under general anesthesia. So we don't get the child to fix it. The cataracts are usually very dense. So the axial length readings may not freeze. Sometimes we have seen they don't freeze even in very high gain. The newer machines like the Lenstar, like the Iron Masters, don't really work for children. And as a general rule, as all of you know, one millimeter axial length error can lead to a 2.5 diopter power change, and a one diopter keratometry error can lead to nearly a one diopter IOL power change. A few terms which I will be using in my talk subsequently is um, prediction error, which is the actual post of refraction minus the predicted post of refraction. So if you have a hyperopic uh, prediction error, that means you have got a more hyperopic outcome than, uh, than predicted. And an absolute prediction error is the absolute difference between the actual post-op refraction and the predicted post-op refraction. It does not have a plus or a minus sign. So in the axial length measurements, we have several, uh, several areas where we can have an error. The contact can have an error by increasing the indentation of the cor cornea, the immersion ultrasound technique, if you don't keep the probe perpendicular to the retina, you can have an error. And in partial coherence interferometry, which is there in the newer machines, you need a good patient cooperation. And it really does not work in very dense cataracts with corneal scars, with retinal dystrophies, so, which is usually found in pediatric cataracts. So par partial coherence interferometry is not really very applicable in small children. Let us see what the literature says. Uh, this is a, a paper by Dr. Rupal Trivedi and Dr. Wilson, and uh, they compared the, uh, the, uh, the immersion technique with the contact technique, and they found that the contact technique was sign showed significant shorter axial length than that of the immersion technique. And then they said that the immersion technique is more accurate in children. Now, what about partial coherence interferometry. There also, on an average, it measured axial lengths 0.1 millimeter less than the immersion ultrasound values, which is taken as the gold standard in children. Now, what about keratometry? Since we can't use the usual keratometer, we use the handheld ones. And uh, uh, this paper discusses the 
uh, the accuracy of the handheld keratometer. And it, they did say that it provides re reliable readings when used intraoperatively on anesthetized non-fixing children. Now coming to the IOL calculation formulas that we have in our armamentarium. Why is it a challenge? Because most of these formulae are actually based on adult eyes and they are based on assumed anterior chamber depth from the manufacturer's A constant. And we know that the effective lens position the, and the axial displacement of the intraocular lens is more pronounced in children because of the dynamics of the PC contraction, uh, the effects of PPC and anterior vitrectomy and the effect of re-proliferation of the lens material, all of them cause a little different expected lens position than that of adults. So what are the formulas that we have? We have many, but we usually use SRK T2, Holiday, Hoffer Q, and sometimes the Barrett's. Now let's see what the literature is showing. This paper uh, uh, was a retrospective analysis of nearly 101 pediatric eyes with cataract surgery, and they found that SRK2 was the least variable, and Hoffer Q gave the most var variable results. But a similar paper by Nihalani et al. said that Hoffer Q gave the minimum prediction error in a, in a series of 135 eyes. And we have uh, LB Prasad paper by Dr. Kekunia's group. They studied uh, IOL power calculation in children less than two years, and they found that SRK2 gave a minimum prediction error. Now, the newer papers, which are uh, comparing the newer formulae with the older ones, uh, they have also come up with the fact that the prediction error for the Barris Universal 2 formula was more than SRKT. We did a study in our own center where we included about 68 eyes, and we also found SRKT and 2 to have a lower prediction error. So if you see, uh, uh, as the literature progresses, we still find the SRK2 and T to be more predictable. And the preferred practice pattern for most pediatric ophthalmologists is SRK2 for pediatric patients. Mm -hmm. Now comes to the next question of undercorrection. We undercorrect uh, or we keep the child hyperopic to uh, balance the myopic shift. Now this balancing has to be a little titrated between the risk of amblyopia by keeping the child very hyperopic or the risk of having a high myopic shift. And there is no one formula fits all. The factors which need to be considered also are the other eye status, the visual acuity in the other eye or the same eye, the parent's refractive error, myopic parents might have myopic children and the expected compliance to glasses. So this again, uh, uh, this paper was published by the LP Prasad group and they validated the guidelines of undercorrection. The usual guidelines for undercorrection uh, that we follow is that suggested by NED and associates and there the age at surgery and the targeted post-operative refraction usually adds up to seven. So they found that this particular um, guideline had uh, a 50 percent of the children achieved a refraction of one diopter and nearly 90 percent within two diopters so they found that these guys have a minute. achieve acceptable refractive error at seven years of age so how how are we um uh, uh, how are we looking at the future we have in pipeline uh, one of the uh, a le concept of two lenses a front lens which can be changed as the power of the child changes. So this is something that we can look forward to. Um, so uh, we also need a customized IOL formula for children. We need newer IOL designs uh, for, uh, to tackle refractive surgeries. And we need studies to understand the factors which are responsible for the refractive changes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sujata. We will have now the last talk uh, from Dr. Jai. She will be speaking on capsule access techniques. Dr. Jai is a consultant at the National Institute of Ophthalmology at Pune. OK. 
uh, I think Dr. Sujata needs to stop sharing. Dr. Sujata, I, yeah, you need to one share the screen. Yeah, just one minute. So in meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can go ahead with the questions. So for uh, all the panelists, there is a question of uh, the use of toric lenses and multifocals, if anybody has a take on them in, in pediatric cataracts. Dr. Sujata. Uh, multifocal IOLs for small children is really not an option because a the uh, the iol power calculation is a little unpredictable b we really don't know how these children's axial length is going to behave in future and um, c the multifocality itself reduces the image quality which can actually add on aggravate the amblyo amblyogenic impulses uh, for older children maybe if they are more than 15 years or so Yes, you can attempt multifocal lenses, but for young children, I think the answer uh, will be no with most pediatric ophthalmologists. What's the experience with uh, toric lenses? Similarly, for multifocal, as in multifocal, in small children, because the contraction of the capsular bag is a little uh, more than that of adults, so the, uh, the toric lens might rotate uh, more than what they do in adults. Uh, so in smaller children, the multifocal and the toric lenses, which actually depend on the capsular contraction to maintain its central position, is uh, not really feasible. For older children, more than 15 years, where all these are actually uh, minimized, uh, you can have torics as well as multifocal. That's my take on it. Thank you, Dr. Jada. Dr. Jai, you ready? So another question for Dr. Kavita. Uh, yes. Do you prefer do you prefer when you have a three piece or a PC rent primarily and a traumatic cataract? Do you yeah. do you do a optical up do you do a capture? Do you attempt a capture on all cases? I and personally do it... I haven't attempted capture. I would rather prefer putting in putting the IOL in the sulcus, a three piece IOL in the sulcus, but capture I haven't uh, done actually in those situations. Capture actually stabilizes the lens. So I would actually uh, um, uh, uh, advocate an IOL capture onto the capsule because the three-piece lens also can move out of its central location. So a capture uh, works beautifully. Yes, ma'am. The agree. anterior or the posterior axis. Uh, these three-piece lenses are sometimes actually small and they do displace when we place it in the circle. Yes. But uh, capture is a very good option during that time. <laughs> While they set up, another thing I would like to mention is that um, if you have the cornea very distorted, you can actually take the K reading of the other eye uh, 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 for the uh, biometry. This is done in situations of traumatic cataract where you are not getting any kind of topography or uh, characterometry reading in the eye that has to be operated. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Koko, you're still around. Dr. Koko, are you still logged on? Okay, so for another question is uh, how do we really assess whether the cataract requires surgery? 
So if uh, anybody's take on it. You mean uh, generally? Is it is it re really required to do? Because we are going to lose a near vision as soon as we do a cataract. Actually, there is a good number of situations where, especially zonular cataracts, uh, they might look like, you know, they might look really significant in the slit lamp, but sometimes these children are very less symptomatic and they may even have six by nine vision uh, bilaterally. And in these situations, just seeing a significant cataract of doesn't warrant uh, uh, surgery if they are having a very good near vision, like uh, you said. Losing near vision permanently is uh, a thing that we have to look into in children. Yeah, there are situations, and even trauma sometimes very minimal lens opacity of a little off center. But if the children is un asymptomatic and have relatively good vision, like six by nine or six by twelve, even at the cost of uh, leaving. Accommodation intact, we may defer or postpone surgery. Yeah, that's a very good uh, point that you raised. So, as Sujata had mentioned about uh, actually taking the corneal readings of the other eye in case of a corneal scar, I think sometimes post operatively that we land up with a lot of surprises in those situations, mainly with the cylindrical errors and things like that. Uh, See, with such a large corneal scar, um you you will uh, add up in uh, end up in surprises yeah there is no way you're going to have a, a absolutely accurate biometric so any role of just putting an rgp uh, yeah, just, uh, is there a role of putting up an rgp lens backing the cornea and then doing the biometry? yes yes that is another one uh, so, I mean, especially if the cataract is not yes. mature, you can have a reading and then yeah, uh, yeah. True. sometimes standard K of 44 44 is a little more reliable than taking the other eye. K. Yeah, the, the other eye should actually have kind of standard K's if you're taking it, okay. but uh, uh, putting RGP and trying to freeze a K uh, or get some kind of topo is a good idea. Okay, are you ready? Because we have already overshot our time. Okay, so then I must apologize though I am not able to get my videos on the screen. So it's not happening. Can you go ahead without your presentation. Can you speak without your presentation? No, it was mainly a video based talk about okay. So any techniques. any pulse so, we need to take. Just pull that um, actually I had planned to show uh, that if you put an IOL, you can just regular... speak about the OEDs you use the 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 the, the instruments you use to do the access. Ah, so for um, Rexis, earlier I used to use, a, I had tried with assisted home, but naturally because the capsule is very elastic, it's very easy to do it, or rather controlled to do it with a Rexis forceps. The main uh, important thing to remember that is to, you have to repeatedly grasp and re-grasp, especially at the advancing edge. The capsule will tend to be long, so the Rexis will tend to be long, much bigger than what you're intending. So be very careful and keep on pulling the Rexis towards the center so that the Rexis doesn't run off. It is good to have a good anterior capsule, a wide um, anterior capsule or axis. Children do have a tendency to get a lot of um, capsule or phimosis afterwards. So a big capsule or capsule axis than what we plan in adults is definitely uh, better. Another thing about posterior capsule or axis is that um, we have many stalwarts who are doing it with the uh, forceps. But I personally feel that after doing it with forceps, the in my hands at least, I could not titrate the size of the capsule or axis. So I found out that after you do that good anterior capsular axis, uh, thoracortical cleanup with posterior post, uh, capsular polishing, to put the lens, but don't let put the lens completely inside, just put the leading haptic in the bag and let the rest of the lens be inside the AC or just dangling out, outwards, and inside the eye, but not at the incision. And then with a vitrectomy cutter, I find it much easier to go inside and make a, a properly graduated or a calibrated um, capsule, posterior capsular axis opening. That saves time also because at the same time, you're also doing the anterior vitrectomy. Whatever tags that are coming towards your pupil are also taken care of by that technique. And once you're complete with your posterior capsule or axis with the cutter and the anterior vitrectomy, you know, putting the trailing haptic inside doesn't become very difficult. And Earlier, I have tried uh, to do a capsule or axis and put a lens, but then in my hands, I found that 
some either the superior haptic would then disengage and come out in the sulcus and that would lead to a lot of handling in these eyes so it's better to have as a smooth surgery as possible so these days i find that doing the capsular posterior capsular access with the cutter with the lens in situ going behind the lens definitely works better do you usually use uh, tricot to stain the tricot assisted yes so if, if i think there are tags then yes diluted um, tricot definitely in the anterior capsular chamber and so is it usually get an idea for you or any tags remaining is it usually a protocol Sorry? for you to do it in every anterior vitrectomy or you just do it not for every anterior case basis you let the so how the lens is rotating and what is the pupil if the pupil is not peaking anywhere then you are sure that there are no tags but yes when you are initially starting and you are not sure it's always better to have tricot at hand because it stains the vitreous very well leading to a very good uh, proper uh, vitreous clean up you don't want tags in the anterior chamber or coming out of the uh, incision uh, thank you dr kelka i think we will have already overshot our time by 20 minutes so we need to wrap it up so if you anybody has a last comment we can take it now or we will thank the panelists and all the speakers on behalf of boa thank you thank you thank you very thank much you very much yeah